Oh dear, internet. This thing's broken. We have a melted battery connector. Was this my fault? Is this the fault of Fox? Is it somebody else's fault? One thing I can be sure of, I definitely crimped this and I've probably done it on camera and shared it in the video with you. But it doesn't to me look like it's my end that was damaged. The, the melting seems to be higher up. But uh, yeah, we're gonna find out what's gone on here and get this thing back up and working. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I will also reveal how the system has been working as an overall picture. Okay, so I wanna preface this video with, I am not associated in any way with Fox ESS inverters. I paid for this inverter, and as you know from my previous videos, it's expensive. I paid for this with my own hard earned money. This leaves me in a wonderful position to be a secret shopper as it were, albeit with high stakes of a broken inverter and a lot of money potentially to fix this. Now, Fox ESS do not have a clue who I am, as far as I'm aware, and as far as I'm aware, they didn't provide me with any service different to what they would for any other customer. There has been some good, and there has been some bad, which I will share in this video. So let's get on with it, hey? Okay, people of the internet, the inverter has been fixed. I'm gonna explain what it took to get there, how much it cost, and use this as an opportunity to let you know how the last nine months has been having installed a full EV battery pack for home energy storage. Yes, it's been an entire nine months. Would I do it again? Well, let's find out in this video. So I'll explain how things went down. There's no secret, it's fixed, and you can enjoy watching me reinstall it while I explain this. My first thought process was to see if this could be covered under warranty. If I'd have damaged this due to an issue that was specific to having a non-standard battery, then I wouldn't have gone down this route. But since this issue could well have happened either way, I proceeded to reach out to Fox ESS service department. After some back and forth, they agreed that a repair was possible. You may be wondering why didn't I just fix this myself? Well, I'll explain a little bit later on in the video. We effectively came to the conclusion that it was either going to cost something for it to get repaired or not cost something. They wouldn't really know until they received the inverter and looked over it. Now, I planned on sending this on a pallet, but given its value, this inverter costing around £2,700, compared to its weight and the cost of additional insurance, I just ended up deciding that, you know what, I'll have a day or a morning out to Coventry and uh, while I'm at it, I'll do a few other things. I entirely intended to drop the inverter off and run. I met the staff who'd been prompted with the issue on this inverter and the service manager walks over and says, should we get this one done now? Five minutes later, I was making us both a brew and parts were removed from a donor inverter and placed into this one. Okay, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I feel like I'm painting this like some spa experience. I think it was just good timing. And uh, yeah, the tea bag was uh, a random decaf one that I found in a cupboard up the top, which weirdly no one else had touched. And the sweetener was the only thing in the drawer. And yeah, basically a tiny little kitchen with a sink, a microwave and uh, a few sparse cupboards. That was the real story. But nonetheless, a cup of tea is a cup of tea. Winner. What I hadn't realised is that there's a sense cable for voltage measurement tied to the connector. Had I done the repair myself, this would have been something else that I would have had to have considered. Whereas just dropping in a replacement cable from their end was a lot easier. It was interesting to look inside the inverter and appreciate the different areas and components that make a huge 30 kilowatt inverter. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know what each part was. But with this repair, there was a circuit board that was right above the battery connector, which slowed things down. The service center had rows of brown boxes with little black writing that gave away the different Fox inverters and batteries that were contained within them. The things I could do if I had just some of the stock in that unit. In the back were staff at computers busy working away, 
and in the workshop corner there were some staff working on PCBs. I had a wander around the unit opposite which was a teaching centre for installers. Before I knew it the repair was complete and the service manager provided me with extra connectors. These are sort of like an MC4 connector but they have a solid pin which is crimped onto the cable. Uh, effectively they're designed to handle more current than a standard MC4 connector. Now Fox gave me a pack of new connectors to re-terminate this but they didn't just do that they gave me a load of larger connectors so I can oversize the cable so they're the same size this end but this end there is a big difference and that is to take a bigger cable you can clearly see that this one is a bit bigger although they're the same this end so that will take a bigger cable. Not sure if the wall is any thicker, but it's definitely designed to take a bigger cable and take it slightly further in, which is a good idea. Larger, beefier versions that would take larger cables. This might prove very handy for ensuring that the best connection is made in the future. You know, it's difficult finding these connectors and that was probably the main reason that stopped me doing this repair myself. These connectors have markings on them, Devlin, Devlin, something like that. And I just could not find them anywhere on the internet. Well, I could find the 35 amp versions, but not the beefier 50 amp versions. Okay, so I'm pretty confident that one is nicely secured in there. I will temperature monitor this later and leave the spares for me to swap if there's an issue, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We can measure it with the thermal imaging camera to see what the deal is. Electricians, tradespeople, or DIYers, thermal imaging cameras are so useful to spot problems and work out where cables or plumbing is in your wall. I mean, the list goes on on their usefulness, doesn't it? But just think, if I had run this thermal imaging camera around this setup before I got this issue, I could have spotted a problem and avoided it getting to the state where it needed to go back to Fox for repair, hopefully. But uh, hey, lessons are learned. If you want a thermal imaging camera, these images are a Top Don TC2, which they sent to me and there is links to it in the description. It will be incredibly useful for future videos where I'm able to visualize for you the heat pump tumble dryer and show our thermal transfer of uh, energy for that project. Anyway, thermal imaging cameras are handy, whichever one you go for. You know, it makes me think, would it just be better if there was some sort of screw down terminal? But having said that, things can always break, an installer would end up snapping that off eventually. While I use this as an opportunity to make sure all of my connections are nice and tight and secure. So what did it cost me and whose fault was this? The service engineer decided like me that it was difficult to determine the exact cause. Was it the connection that was terminated or was it the connector itself? So here is our length of broken cable and the connector on there all charred up from the heat melted plastic but <clears throat> that is properly in there still <clears throat> no I can pull that as hard as I want to and those are not coming out so yes there's a possibility that there's just a poor connection in there not good enough to handle the 50 amps a bit of a high resistance which over time increases and causes this thing to have problems but we'll kind of never know because it's all a charred mess i think that is further up but as fox seemed to think that is the place where overheating will show up either way none of that matters because fox sorted it out which is perfect, isn't it? Okay, so an honest review of Fox ESS customer service. So at the end of all of this, Fox ESS did not charge me for the repairs and fixed it pretty quickly. 
I've got to say the email service engineer came across as if he was trying to wiggle out of any blame. At one point he even accused me of using 4mm squared cabling. I did ask how on earth he was able to tell that from a photo. If I had genuinely had a bad experience with Fox ESS, I would have shared that story too. But they were in control of the narrative, even if they didn't know that there was a narrative, and I'd say they passed. I'm sure they don't like what we're doing here. A group of people that reverse engineered the inverter to battery communications and are connecting non-approved batteries to the inverters. But you'll never stop people trying to find solutions to problems. The problem being that their HV batteries are ridiculously expensive. Don't forget to let me know in the comments below if this honest review of Fox ESS customer service is useful to you in any way. So before we move on to how the system has been working as an overall picture, my only gripe with this, obviously my gripe is that it broke, but as we know, that could have been my fault, could have been Fox's fault, who knows. But my only gripe is, when you've got solar installed onto this, it won't let you force charge from the grid. Now, that sounds like a firmware problem which they could update, but Fox ESS don't share their change logs to their... Uh, their updates so uh, yeah let's move on to the battery how have the batteries been operating well since the PCS power conversion system broke in this one it's been working flawlessly and the other one has been working flawlessly is it okay on the wall has it fallen down as some people might have expected nope as you can see it's still here in the early days, we had some creaks in the house, and I'd come running out just to make sure it wasn't this. Got me a bit paranoid, but this thing has not moved, bearing in mind we've got 500 kilos up vertical on the wall, and the battery doesn't seem to be suffering for this. Now, I've got two batteries at the minute. One of them is in the orientation of the car, and the other one is like this, which is good for comparing the two, and it's been absolutely fine. If you remember back to a previous video, this one actually still, despite it being summer and a heatwave, has lagging on the inside, whereas the other one doesn't. That has resulted in a 10 degree increase compared to the other battery, and I think the highest I've seen is about 40 degrees. Now that is pushing the limits of how much I want out of this battery, but bearing in mind the battery that's under the stairs, it's a lot lower than that battery. It's on the limit of what is usable and I could of course thermally cool this battery or just change my usage pattern on how I charge and discharge this. I tend to discharge in the evening and charge back up overnight helping the grid but I could change this because the tariff I'm on now doesn't need me to do that. Okay so this is uh, quite dusty it needs a, needs a good clean. There is one elephant in the room though that I have not covered about the Tesla batteries. Now when I joined this project, this was the only supported LFP, lithium ion phosphate battery, the type of battery that's used in all home energy storage, which meant that this was the only battery that I could choose to go with. Since then, people have supported with the BYD Atto 3 as well. But there is a great big issue with the LFP Tesla batteries, which could be the demise of this system in a few years time if we don't come to a solution. Basically, they don't seem to balance. We don't know at this stage whether it's because we're not telling the BMS that more things are connected to it, but in the car, the Tesla Model 3s tell you to, or the manual, tells you to charge the battery up to 100% is it once a week or once a month and that is so that the pack can reach its maximum voltage and balance 3.8 volts has been seen in there which people will know that that's way higher than the 3.65 the cells are designed to go to so we've tried a few different things but uh, basically it needs smart people to get together to be able to read the data off the little boards that sends to the BMS you, you could be that smart person. If you're not already involved in the project, you watch these videos and you're interested in it, then check out the GitHub and perhaps consider joining Dala's Discord, the guy that uh, originally came up with the software. You could be a contributor. 
and uh, you might be the smart guy that uh, that can handle that. But until then, it is working, but we're starting to get an imbalance. I'm seeing about 300 millivolts on this pack when this pack is fully charged. The other pack doesn't seem to be so bad, but I think I did a bit of damage when I ran it without the PCS a little while back. But we're still we're still getting great uh, mileage out of it, as it were. So, would I do this again? 100%. It's been fantastic. It's been a learning curve. I learned so much more about high voltage interlocks and CAN bus that I didn't know before. But it's definitely not for the faint of heart. This sort of thing needs you to be multi-skilled and ideally to know a good electrician or to be an electrician yourself because there's just safety critical things here. This isn't for the faint of heart at all. But there we are. So everything is back to working. Maybe we'll do another update in another nine months, another year, two years, and just see how the system is performing. Hopefully we won't have as much drama as that. But uh, yeah, you know how these things go. So until next time, Battery Man out. Thanks for watching. <coughs>